Hi guys, I'm going to give people a minute to arrive and then we will jump in. So just let me know people when you can hear me to arrive and you can hear me. Okay. All right. I, uh, tonight we're going to be doing another Q and a, the last one went really well. You guys had lots of really good questions. So we're just going to keep this going, you know, on every other week. That seems to be a good cadence. And then that gives us the opportunity to spend Friday nights together. Anyway, um, so I am just going to start going through the list again, uh, you know, to have your question stand out, just put, <clears throat> excuse me, question in all caps. All right. Okay. Oh, there is one thing I want to hit on because these questions are popping up a lot in um, the YouTube comments. So it's around the sandals. So I thought I would kick off with that. Um, and I'm going to share my screen for a minute. Okay, so it's a little dry going through the FOIA docs, but in this case, I think it's well worth it. So <clears throat> a few little details. Um, first of all, people have been operating under the assumption that they left in such a hurry that Tylee and Lori didn't have shoes on. And that was actually her claim. So you can see here, I'm not going, well, I'll read the whole thing. I met with Detective Moffat at the station and provided a synopsis of both interviews to him. Detective Moffat, he led the investigation. He's no longer on the case, but he completed the interview with the male shooter. That was Alex, excuse me. And I facilitated Lori speaking with personnel from Victims Services. Not even going to go there. At the conclusion of the interviews, Detective Moffat and I transported Lori, her brother, and Tylee back to the residence together, and Detective Moffat provided his contact information to them via business card, encouraging them to contact him for any reason. Uh, later, Detective Yinklin who was interviewed alongside of Detective Moffat for Dateline, uh, expressed dismay that uh, they never got in touch with them again. Anyway, the processing of the crime scene, <clears throat> excuse me, had not been completed. So the three left the location after I indicated I would contact them when the processing was complete. Tylee asked me about getting something out of the house before leaving, and Lori indicated they had stopped to buy shoes at CVS because they left the house without shoes, with Lori pointing at the flip-flops they were wearing. Anyway, she said that they couldn't go into the house, and they were okay with that. But <clears throat> elsewhere in the FOIA docs, uh, let's see, it says here the feed labeled whatever started at time marker 819. Uh, so this was 819 in the morning. Keep in mind, uh, uh, yeah, I think Charles arrived around 837 and then Lori left with his phone. I think, I mean, I'm sorry. 7.37, and then Lori left with his phone, uh, I think 7.49. So they went to uh, Burger King, then they went to one Walgreens that was already closed. They went to another Walgreens and then dropped JJ off at school. So, uh, <clears throat> so this started at the 8.00. Uh, time marker 819 and showed a person whom appeared to be Lori Vallow paying at a register. The screen label read register two for two for two pair of brightly colored sandals. One pair was yellow, 
green and patterned, we know that these were the sandals that Ty Lee was wearing because you could see them when she was being interviewed or maybe when she was waiting, but when she was in the interview room. And the other was black and white stripe pattern that may have also had another color to it. Lori paid for the sandals with cash in the video. In that video, she appears to be wearing sandals as well. So she didn't go into the store barefoot. She was already wearing sandals. So she lied. She lied to investigators when she was interviewed. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this was uh, a snippet from Summer's interview. And, um, and I'm not going to read the first paragraph. You can always pause the video and read that if you are so inclined. But it says that Lori told Summer that after the shooting, she took Tylee and JJ away from the house. She took the rental car that Charles had loaded JJ into and drove to Burger King to get JJ food. She and Ty Lee then took JJ to school. Lori told her that they left the house without shoes. So according to Summer, Lori told her the same story. So they also stopped to buy some flip-flops. Then they returned to the house and spoke with police. Summer agreed that Lori's actions were weird. So look at summer sounding reasonable. Anyway, so I just wanted to uh, clear up some of the confusion around that, that she was seen on video wearing sandals into the store. Okay. All right. Let me back up. Okay. Uh, Jennifer asked, I had heard Lori's attorney died and she owed him a lot of money. Do we know the time frame of this event and if she took off? So yes, there, there are allegations that her attorney who died, I can't think of his name off the top of my head, but, um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, but that uh, I think it was her bankruptcy attorney. And I, I know that I know this individual's name. If you remember it, up, up, mm, yeah, if you remember it, drop it in the chat. And it'll come to me probably right after the live. But uh, yeah, it is said that she she said something to the effect that the timing worked out well because she owed him a lot of money. So um, I, I know, yeah, I, let's see, stop the screen. Um, Tylee, Lori. Yeah, I, I know it'll, it'll come to me. Yeah, because they're, yeah, okay. I'm going to have to move on. I... Oh, okay. His name was Edwin and his nickname was uh, Ted and his last name was Terry. I believe that was uh, the attorney she owed money to. So <clears throat> yeah. Um... Oh, wait, no, this... This might have been the same attorney, but yes, yeah, she had actually claimed that he uh, visited her like after his death. So yeah, this would have been the same attorney because 
her other attorney is still alive. Um, but let me see if I can pull this up. Yeah, his, uh, this is very weird. Okay. Okay. All right. So I will share my screen again. Okay. So this came from the FOIA docs around Lori and Joe's divorce, as well as Cheryl and Charles. So disregard the color coding. I went a little crazy. Lastly, Ms. Vallow genuinely believes her child is in danger. However, her belief system is riddled with ghosts and seemingly fanatical religious dogma. Now keep in mind, this was back in 2007. Her belief that Mr. Terry, may he rest in peace, visits her at night borders on visual and auditory hallucinations. But this examiner is not an expert in her religion and wants to give her as much benefit of the doubt as possible. That is a pattern. But not at the expense of this little girl's relationship with her father. At this time, Tylee does not even know Joseph Ryan is her father. This comes from the mother and most likely the new stepfather. She has lost touch with that belief system and the opinions of others until she finds someone who will agree that Tylee has been abused. So again, this was 2007. So this has been a, a per persistent pattern for her. Okay. But the part about her owing him a lot of money, um, that, that wasn't, I don't believe that was documented in, in these, uh, like court documents. Okay. All right. Let's see. And, you know, once again, I, I'm just like skimming ahead to, um, to comments that start with question in all caps. Okay. Uh, okay. So Jen, this is a different one, uh, asks, do you think Alex was a murder victim? If so, how and by whom? I wonder if Zulema poisoned him. Thanks for everything. Yes, I absolutely do. Uh, because in the Reddit email, the infamous Reddit email, after all that Alex did, according to the insider who wrote this email, Alex was also identified as a zombie. So anyone who was identified as a zombie um, was, well, not everyone who was identified as a dark spirit or a zombie was murdered. There were too many of them. And, uh, I, and according to Lori, when she was texting back and forth with Alex, she had said that she had identified the like 20th zombie. And so it was like, it was, it might've been 50, but anyway, it was a certain number of zombies that impacted her personally. And, um, but anyway, <clears throat> so yes, I, I do believe that he was identified as a zombie because he, one, he knew way too much Two, he, according to Zach Cox, he was a, a weird guy. Now, you can also tell from his text messages, his communications, that he was very slow. And I think he most likely had some kind of learning disability. But um, yeah, so I, I think, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about this before, but he didn't seem to have an internal editor. So I think it was Zach. Yeah, Zach had also said that Alex had told their bishop that Lori had seen Jesus and had talked to him. And when Lori found out about this, she was really upset, you know, so 
It, he just didn't seem to have a filter and that would have been easy to manipulate um, when law enforcement, you know, uh, eventually tracked him down. Now law enforcement had plenty of opportunity to arrest Alex. They, they didn't, but uh, in Lori and Chad's minds, I, I think that he was expendable. And I think also in Chad's patriarchal blessing to Alex, he kind of hints at that. Like, you know, really his purpose is to protect Lori. But at one point, um, it, it was said that, and that this might have also been in the Reddit email that I guess when Chad and Lori got married, then, you know, um, uh, Alex would like Chad would pick up and he would be her protector. So, um, yeah. So, but then also, you know, there, there's just too much pink foam and there's, uh, there are too many pulmonary embolisms in this story. And so, yeah, I do believe that he was murdered as far as who did it. I mean, if I had to put money down on something and we are moving into the conjecture lane here, my money would be on Zulema. Uh, we know that she references um, a bag of cash. She said that it was between five and seven thousand dollars. Now, would she have not known exactly how much money was in that bag? No, I just don't think that that's reasonable for us to believe. So, I think that that may have been a, a payoff, uh, and I think. The only reason she would have mentioned it is I think she didn't do anything with it before Alex uh, was murdered. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Who knows? So uh, she may have been concerned that they would, you know, do a thorough search of the home. They did get a search warrant, but according to what, well, at least from what I've seen in the FOIA docs, they didn't collect that much from her home. Okay. Thank you, Chris H. Very sweet. Ah, thank you, DC Babos, <laughs> Babos. Okay. All right. I love reading the chat afterwards, like uh, sometime in the weekend, I go through the chat. So I do see your comments, even though I don't see them during the live, because I just want to keep things, you know, kind of productive, productive and moving forward. But okay, uh, let's see. <laughs> Janice. Lori lied. I know it's shocking and somewhat disillusioning. Okay. Uh, Jake asked, can you summarize Summer and her role? Uh, okay. Um, oh, welcome. Welcome. New subscriber. Okay. Uh, and he, he also said, I thought I studied everything, but Summer is an interesting character based on your short commentary in the past. Yeah. Summer is a really interesting character. Um, I, I so my take on Summer is when the kids, when, when it became public that the kids had gone missing, the Cox family was pretty much radio silence on all fronts, which was very disconcerting to me right from the beginning. Because when I heard that the kids were missing, I was a few days behind when they announced it publicly. Because <clears throat> earlier that year, I had, uh, yeah, I, I just had to like turn off cable and, um, and I was watching too much CNN. And our country was so divided. But 
anyway, so I, I missed the news. A family member uh, passed it on to me. So the first thing I did was look for you know, some kind of press conference because usually when children go missing, there's a press conference that family does with, you know, with law enforcement. And I couldn't find that anywhere. And I knew from having visited that they were a very close knit family. So that was, that was very concerning. And then we didn't hear anything from summer until May, uh, to, uh, May, 2020. So what happened in May? And I kind of have to give a little bit of this backstory to explain how I interpret Summer's role. Excuse me. So May, 2020, the Cox family rolled out with this media blitzkrieg. And there were two main talking points. One uh, was Lori was a perfect mother and two, uh, Joe was the real bad guy, my brother, uh, Joe, and he was a pedophile and, you know, all, all of these things. And so we heard from Summer and Janice, and Melanie, uh, Pulowski, Colby, uh, you know, outside of his channel. And, um, uh, who else? Oh, and Melanie Gibb, though she's not a family member, but there were all of these interviews in kind of rapid succession. Uh, and so, um, so the unfortunate thing with Janice and Summer is that if they had just held out a few more weeks, um, the kids, well, they wouldn't have ever had to make a public statement, but because the kids were found less than a month, I think, after the, the, they kind of hit the media circuit. So early on, you know, her talking points were Lori was a perfect mother, not a perfect mother, but a very good mother. Um, she was confident that Lori would never hurt her children. If her children had been hurt, it would have been by someone else. Um, oh, that. Um, Charles was, he was the one who was into money. He was kind of flashy. Lori just wanted a happy family. That was an actual quote from her. And so she was just very pro Lori. This, you know, she kind of set the, the stage that if anything happened to the kids, Lori wouldn't have had anything to do with it. Meanwhile, back in Gotham City, we found out after this interview, someone had gotten a hold of a video that she had made uh, as a memorial for Alex for his funeral. And this video got out and it circulated through the Facebook groups. And there were no pictures. No, this video would have been created in December of 2019 because Alex died, I think December 12th. So this video would have been created in December or maybe early January. I think he was, they had their little ceremony in January, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, um, pretty soon after he died, but well before they did their interview and Tylee and JJ were not included in this memorial video at all. All of the other cousins were in the video. Colby was in the, the video. Um, you know, pictures of Colby um, were in the video and Zach Cox. And so, you know, uh, lots of familiar faces, but Tylee and JJ were not in this video. So that suggested to me that, that Summer knew a lot more than she was saying. Fast forward to the Chandler FOIA docs coming out. Well, actually before the Chandler FOIA docs came out, well, there was one batch, but we didn't really learn much about Summer in the first batch. Then they announced 
that they were going to uh, be pursuing or that Chandler police was recommending charges be brought against Lori. So they released this uh, affidavit of probable cause. And I had gone into that. This isn't like a humble brag or anything like that. I had gone into that affidavit and just, you know, playing around with like the fonts and, um, and a list of names of like some of the, the key players. I was like taking jabs at unredacting this affidavit of probable cause. Now I just shared the full affidavit um, and uh, every redaction in the affidavit of probable cause was unredacted at some point in the police report. So where am I going with this? In the affidavit, we found out that like Summer's name fit in this really one key uh, redaction where it said, I'll kill him myself. And, you know, I was a little nervous about putting that out there. I only shared that in a private Facebook group. So at least it wasn't like, you know, for public consumption. But, uh, but that was confirmed. It was Summer who said to Lori in a text, I'll kill him myself. Lori said, no, we need you safe or I need you safe. So this, so clearly she had a horse in this race. There was another uh, place in the, the FOIA docs where, where Summer had told Lori, this was back in January, she had given Lori a heads up that Charles was, um, that, uh, that he had secured a pickup order for her. So Lori acted when she went into that interview in Gilbert police, like she didn't know about this, but Summer had given her a heads up. But Summer actually told her you, something to the effect of like she she knew, like Summer knew that Lori had uh, a special mission and that she was doing her mission. So that was also very, very surprising. In fact, I'm going to see if I can find that, um, that quote, because that it was just really stunning, like summer and she is the younger sister. So she may have been, a a, a bit of, I don't know, um, like a sycophant with Lori. Um, but that, in my opinion, that went beyond uh, the the pale of like, this is not just her saying, hey, I'm really sorry these terrible things are happening to you. Um, you know, how can I support you? It was, you have uh, a mission. Ah, I found it. Okay, so I will share my screen again. We're just going to bounce back and forth. because I think that this is interesting. Okay. Summer, Lori's sister texted Lori and stated, this was January 31st. So this is when everything was going down. Uh, this was when Lori, Tylee and Melanie Gibb went to the Gilbert police station. Uh, this is the same day Charles uh, stole Lori's purse and you know there was just a lot going down okay so summer texted Lori and stated he talked to jeff and mimi this morning and told them that you left him and that he called the police and if they track you down uh there was a typo they are taking you in for a psych eval mm. excuse me so this was this was very surprising to me and this was in uh i believe the Chandler FOIA doc, the second one. He told Mimi that he had someone from, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, Bishopric, I'm not, Bishopric, I, I have no idea, um, or stake presidency, listening in on a conversation you had with him where you told him you would kill him and that you are married to Moroni and that whoever was listening, so this was Gabe, the bishop, 
was going to have your recommends suspended until they talk to you. And that did happen. Lori's uh, temple recommend was suspended because Charles texted her and said, don't go into work today. Your temple recommend has been suspended. Okay. I just want you to know what we are hearing on our end. So here, here's summer running reconnaissance, which is a pattern for summer. I want you to know that I 100% support you. I am here if there is anything I can do for you to help. The fact he would try to get your recommend suspended shows extreme evil and malicious intent. I know you have help from the other side. I know you are being inspired to know what to do and you are prepared to do your mission. So she just said, hey, you know, so Charles ordered a psych eval and was awarded a, a psych eval because you threatened to kill him and you were married to Moroni and all of these things. But then she follows it up. Like you would think a sister would be like, what is going on? What, you know, like, have you lost your mind? But no, she, she follows it up with, I, I support you. I know that you have help from the other side. You are being inspired to know what to do and you are prepared to do your mission. I support you. I love you. I am here for you. I am so sorry you have to go through all of this crap. So yeah, and then in the, the FOIA docs, it also states that um, Summer was a believer in, in th this group and um, their extreme beliefs. So they listed her as, as one of the believers. So yeah, so we don't know, you know, exactly what made them, you know, we don't, we don't know everything that they have, but, uh, yeah, Summer, Summer is, you know, she's stepped in some pretty deep yogurt. All right. Um, Oh, Lisa asked about an email address. You can email um, to a murderous heart at gmail.com. Oh, Amanda, thank you. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Joyce asked the hundred dollar question. In your opinion, was this a matter of lust and greed? Um, ah, thanks from someone who donated to your petition. Um, I think you mean signed the petition. But um, but thank you very much for doing that. So I I don't monetize this channel in any way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Yes, I absolutely believe that this is all about uh, lust, power, and greed. So not everyone was appeared to be motivated by lust. And yeah, I, I think there, there was greed involved. I don't think... I. I don't really get too much into motives because that's very much outside my wheelhouse. I do much better with facts, but I think I, I talked about this a, a little bit in the last live, but I think that Melanie Gibb had very different motivations from like Zulema. I would put Zulema more in the greed category when it came to, well, Potentially. Um, but I think that they were both very motivated by power. I think you know, everyone in this group was somehow marginalized. And and I, and usually that's a pretty key factor in being able to um, you know rope people in to groups like this. So yeah. Um but yeah, when it comes to Lori and Chad and um, 
Julie Rowe. I, I think that the entire teaching about multiple probations, in my opinion, was just a justification to be able to have sex with whomever they wanted uh, without, you know, like somehow they were able to justify what their religion tells them about, you know, having, you know, committing adultery and uh, it, by just saying, well, it's okay because we were married in a previous probation. So yeah, I think that, yeah. So yeah, I would throw in power, but I don't, I personally don't think that any of this had to do with religion. I think they were all just using religion as like uh, talking points. Um, I, I think some of the people who were more peripherally, peripherally involved, like some of Lori's friends like from Hawaii and, you know, but some of the women who were on the periphery who participated in these, you know, castings, which were really just <clears throat> murder prayers. Um, I think they were fascinated by being able to like, I think they thought they were like flying close enough to the sun for it to be kind of exciting um, but not too close that they would actually get singed. And with the FOIA docs, you know, I, th I think they, they all ended up getting singed. They all flew too close to the sun. So, um, you know, either by acts of uh, commission, in other words, you know, being an, an active member of this group, helping to justify the murder of victims by identifying them as zombies and, you know, using these special powers, whether it's, you know, <clears throat> the elements or, you know, water or fire, whatever, you know, they all thought they came to the table with some special power that they were using to try to murder, excuse me, Um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. So I think for them, I don't even think they were so motivated by power as much as it, it was, it was just exciting. And I think like when it comes to Melanie Gibb, I think she did think that she was going to kind of, you know, sit at uh, Chad and Lori's right hand, along with her then new husband, David Warwick. There, there have been uh, rumors and statements from um, one source who is very, who has been very credible and is very close to the situation that they um, have at minimum uh, separated. I think that they are divorced, but uh, keeping it on the, the DL. So, but um, I think that Melanie very much needed that tent city. You know, she had divorced her previous husband. She was couch surfing. Uh, she was, you know, um, she stayed with Lori for a little bit. She stayed with David um, and a couple other places. So, yeah, I think I think she just really needed this tent city. And I I think there were others you, who were much more peripheral um, who also uh, were very much looking forward to these tent cities. So I think. Melanie, you know, she definitely has a tendency to be very preachy, um, very kind of prone toward like public rebuke and wanting to, you know, use her position in this as, you know, as, as some kind of, uh, I, I don't know, some kind of like higher moral ground to be able to caution other people, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think when she published that AVAL letter, uh, for me, that 
just put her motives on um, on public display. And she she wrote that letter to Aval. She published it on the Aval forum, but then there was a a note on the post where it was published on East Idaho News that stated that they were asked to publish this. So this wasn't like there were rumors like, oh, no, you know, it, it was leaked. Like she didn't actually publish it. No, she she published it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, someone asked, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, Aisha, Aisha. I'm not sure. Sorry. Uh, what do you think of all these new filings for Lori? I'm pretty sure they have something to do with her competency. But, you know, everything is just being, you know, suppressed. Everything's being, you know, so um, I'm, I'm sure someone has made the case that, um, you know, the uh, the public's right to know is overshadowed by something more compelling um, that could potentially put the case in danger. I, I'll, I'll be honest, I don't get too focused on all of the filings. One, there are just so many hearings uh, in, in this case. Uh, but then also... You know, I, I, I just, I can't, I can't really manage like the, the ebb and flow of like hoping for something and then, you know, it not happening. So I, I really am like super focused on digging into what we know. And I, I will say I do, and I'm not, well, yeah, I don't say anything to flatter but I, I do feel very confident that justice will be done in Idaho. If any justice comes out of Arizona, it's going to be hard one uh, because of the lack of investigation. Uh, and it will be icing on the cake, in my opinion. Okay, I just happened to notice a question mark, but uh, tastefully frugal. Um, oh, I love that name. I love thrifting. Love it. Anyway, uh, so, um, but I did see a, a question mark. So, um, but you didn't mark it with question. So the FOIA docs mentioned bank records being pulled. Was there any info found that was financially tying the group of people? I bet the conspiracy can also be traced by following the money. You know, it, they're pretty careful about specific references to money. So we know that Lori had Tylee's bank card. We know that Lori or someone um, was making transfers from Tylee's Venmo account to Colby and also from Lori's Venmo account. So we know there were transactions there. Um, the, what we know about the, you know, the life insurance money. And we know by Zulama's own admission about the bag of money, which I just mentioned um, a little earlier. And I can't think if there... I, I'm sure there were other references to money, but I, I imagine most of those details will come out in trial uh, because we do know that they uh, they ran Lori's bank records very early on. But that was also, I believe that was done in, uh, by Idaho, by Rexburg, Fremont County, the Idaho contingency. And we are not going to get FOIA docs from Idaho uh, before the trials. So a lot of that information um, has, has been withheld. Oh, thank you, Diana. Uh, she said, Ted Terry died November 22nd, 2006, cause of death, cardiac arrest.
Thank you, Eric. Very sweet. Okay. Um, oh. Hmm. Crocheting Bami asked, can you talk us through what it would take for law enforcement to do their job and arrest at least Lori for the murder of Joe? Well, <clears throat> first of all, we don't know that he was murdered because no investigation has ever been done into his death. Now, Phoenix police were very careful and pretty wily when they made their announcement that they were, I forget the word that they, oh, they were reviewing um, his, his case. So reviewing could be as simple as pulling the file out, flipping through it and putting it back. But the, uh, the detective who inherited Joe's case or, and really his file, uh, I think his name is detective Johnny Meyer. Um, I spoke to him and I've talked about this before, but he was very condescending. <clears throat> he let me know that they absolutely were not going to um, open his his case. And he went so far as to tell me, Miss Cushing, your brother died of a heart attack. And so if I have been a thorn in law enforcement side, you can some to degree thank him for it. Uh, because that was, you know, it, it just didn't need to get to that. Like I wasn't being combative or... Anyway, so, um, you know, like my appeal has just been that they investigate his death for a number of reasons. And I did a live all about Joe. I think I did. Yeah, I did two different lives. I did one live about Joe and then I did a live right after starting uh, Cool Cats and Criminals uh, because someone, a reporter had passed on the pictures from the day of Joe's welfare check. And I, I wasn't able, I wasn't, you know, um, it, it was under the condition that I didn't share them because, you know, the, um, that source wanted first right of refusal, of course. <clears throat> this was very, very gracious of this reporter to pass them on. But then I circled back months later and asked if I could publish them in, in this group. And so I had gone through these pictures. Now, I wasn't able to publish all of them because some of them were very graphic. But going through the pictures, you know, I went through them uh, along with Ginny Summers. We, we went through them together and then put all the, all the pictures that could be put up in cool cats and us as a group, um, went through them. And there are a number of really significant red flags. And, um, so I went through those. I won't, I won't go through them now, but my appeal has just been like at absolute minimum, get a search warrant for his electronic records, because depending on what cell, cell carrier he used, each of these cell carriers keep records for differing periods of time. You know, so some keep them for years, some only months, you know, so there's, there's quite a differential uh, among these carriers. So that's, that's been like my strongest appeal. Like, you know, like if, if it comes out because it could come out, you know, with, with all of the, you know, the, the grand juries and with these upcoming trials and, and stuff, you know, like the chances of their, of something coming out that indicates that Lori did play a role in Joe's death. We need those electronic records. So anyway, so that's that's what it would take. And I think an inclination to 
um, to include his death in these investigations, as well as some of these other, you know, uh, suspicious deaths, um, like Alex Cox, um, you know, because it, even if, I mean, I'm, I'm really, okay, I will say, first of all, I'm surprised I haven't seen any indicators that they've checked for malachite in these, um, in these different autopsies. We don't, we haven't seen Tammy's autopsy yet, but with Lori's obsession with malachite, you know, it, and with poisoning, um, you have to check for specific poison. So you can't just like check for any evidence of poisoning. And I learned that from Dr. Uh, Salerno. Love her. She is one of my favorites. Uh, <clears throat> but um, so you can't just do like a cart launch check for, hey, is there, is that, did you find the presence of any poison in, in the blood? So um, yeah, but uh, yeah. I, and even with Eldon Clausen, um, uh, and I've mentioned this before, but I think his death should be investigated. It doesn't matter if the family doesn't want it investigated. It is suspicious and it is tied to, I mean, it, it happened within a week of uh, JJ being buried on Chad's property. We know that Alden Clausen, according to neighbors, we have a number of posts in Cool Cats. If you're in the group, some of the stuff I wouldn't put out for public consumption, but um, we know according to neighbors, well, I shouldn't say we know. Neighbors have said that Eldon would walk along the, the creek, the, the street in front of Chad's house and the creek along the side of Chad's house. And that's where JJ was buried. So, and he was like this self-appointed water, Janice calls it water Nazi or irrigation. I think, yeah. Um, but there's actually a name for it. And there's someone who is paid to make sure that farms only use the water on their assigned days. But Eldon took it upon himself to also monitor this. And, um, and so, you know, he could have confronted Chad just for burying something close, that close to a water source. Um, so, you know, but anyway, so yeah, I think that there are a number of deaths that should be folded into this investigation. Okay. Hmm. Someone asked, Hey, Sherry, hey, that's the name. Um, how much truth, truth do you think there is to the allegations that Cheryl Wheeler has or had against Charles about Munchausen's um, by proxy and having his son medically treated against her voice? It is, that is impossible to know. Be, there are definitely some very serious allegations that um, Cheryl brought in these court documents uh, against Charles, against um, Colby, you know, um, and, and these allegations kind of went in all directions. When you look at the, uh, some of the documents in that FOIA doc dump, um, yeah, there, there were allegations going in all directions. So yeah, so I, it, it's, it's just impossible uh, to know, but there, there were troubling signs. Um, there, <clears throat> we know that from these FOIA docs, uh, that there was also a very combative relationship between Charles and Joseph and um, there are allegations that Charles hired two 
um, men to tailgate Joseph and um, another woman was in uh, Joe's car along with Tylee. And I have heard from this woman. So, you know, I, I think that there, there were concerns, but I, I think it comes back to, you know, I did a live uh, from my analytics channel about, you know, like there, there are some really tough things to look at in these FOIA docs. And I feel like, you know, some of them really require the wisdom of Solomon, like, you know, like the fact that Charles was catfished um, by a number of women pretty seriously by one woman. And so there were allegations that different people have made that Charles was supporting other women. And that is supported in the, the FOIA docs. And one of them, I mean, it was a, they, they gave him, um, information for a Nigerian bank account. And yeah, he was catfished um, pretty badly. Um, but he was also, I think, just on his G chat alone, so his Google chat, I think he was maintaining chats with, I believe it said um, like 12 or 13 women. So that was just in in his Google chat. And I don't say this to shame him. Like, you know, Charles very much like Joe, very much like really most people who are murdered. Like if you dig enough in a person's life, you're going to find, you know, you're going to find things. So he was still a victim, but yeah. So I, yeah, I just, I don't know. I didn't see, I mean, all I can say is in my very limited experience with Charles, I, I didn't see any signs, but it's also, you know, pretty easy to put your best foot forward when you're just with someone for a week or less. Hmm. I tilt my head away because this mic is so sensitive. Okay. Melissa asked, does law enforcement have a theory as to why the two kids were murdered so differently? And, uh, you know, and, and she also said, I'm sorry to ask that. Please don't answer if it's not comfortable for you. I just cannot understand. So in, in these lives, well, first of all, it, it, it has been helpful to have some distance from this. Um, but also it's much easier to, you know, kind of, um, gauge my, uh, emotions in a live like this rather than in an interview with reporters, because you might see three minutes of a three hour interview and, you know, and they might've been digging quite a bit before they get you know, a pretty strong emotional response. And that's just one of the many reasons I am, I am done with interviews <clears throat> with probably pretty rare exception. But, um, having said that, I think that they're very different. Uh, I mean, you know, ultimately they were both murdered. So, uh, please, when I talk about this, I am not in any way minimizing the the crimes against JJ because like that one picture of JJ on that ride I mean it's so haunting it's so deeply disturbing to me I I think he was at Bear World uh he just looks utterly lost you know, and he also, he didn't understand what was happening. So they both suffered like their last year for both Tylee and JJ were hellish their, their last year on this earth, <clears throat> but for very different reasons. Having said that, um, I, I think that the, uh, just the absolute, you know, um, desecration of Tylee's remains 
were an expression expression of rage. Um, I I think they justified it by identifying her as a very dark spirit. She was only you know one tenth of a point away from Joe's rating, and he was marked as um, uh, uh, what did they call that? Um, uh, I forget how sealed away. I think yeah. And so, you know, and I'm assuming that that means that like Joe wouldn't qualify for another probation because he was just so evil. Um, he, he was DQ'd. And I suspect that Lori also put Tylee in that same group. And I think her continual like campaigning against Tylee was also part of what made others very negative about Tylee, you know, including like, you know, you, um, you see Alex making, I think he texted Zilema, you know, something about, you know, just Tylee being so dark and how that impacted their trip to Idaho. Well, Tylee drove by herself in the Jeep. So they weren't even in the same car. Like they, they could, well, anyway, I'm not even, but we know that Tylee was driving by herself as a 16 year old. And she had also driven by herself from Texas to Arizona. Um, you know, because, uh, she talked to a friend of hers during the drive, according to her friend, and she asked her to keep her company because she was alone. So anyway, so I, I think it was an expression of just absolute rage. And I think they somehow uh, justified, I don't know. I don't know how they justified uh, either of these murders. But you see JJ being buried under a tree next to, you know, a, a water source. It was just a ditch. But um, yeah, so yeah, I think it was, uh, I think it was according to their light and dark ratings. Now, originally, JJ was, I think, like a three point something on the um, the light rating scale. Um, and he was, he was almost as high as, um, let me see, let me see, I might have this. Um, he was like just a little bit lower than Lori. Excuse me. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I forget what, what his, um, light rating was, but, Chad had said that, you know, like if your light rating was um, higher than, I think it was like 3.0 and higher, that they, people who were either, you know, th three and higher on either end, light or dark, that they rarely uh, switch sides because they actually made covenants. So if you were a three, you know, in a dark rating or, or higher, it was because you made a covenant with the devil. So you couldn't switch. And, but he put in a rarely, and I think that was just because they weren't exact, they weren't uh, decided. I suspect they weren't decided on if they were going to murder JJ. But, um, but even though he was such a light rating, um, he was then deemed a, a zombie afterwards and, um, or, or later. And then that's how his murder was justified. Okay. All right. Uh, Jenny said, I have so many questions about Ian. When did, when did he join the cult? before or after marrying Melanie? Well, it really depends if you believe Ian. So if we believe Ian, he, he met Melanie 
after her divorce was finalized, um, it, like it would have been, I think the day after her divorce was finalized. So that's pretty convenient. I think the timing, like the whole, like they say nine days in one place and 10 days in, in another. Um, and so I think that was most likely to keep her temple recommend. But, um, so he either knew Melanie longer than nine days um, and was already a part of this group, or as I mentioned in the live that I did about Melanie, I do wonder if he was drawn to her because of the cash inflow she experienced um, even before for her divorce was finalized um, from Brandon because, you know, she experienced a windfall of $300,000. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, and, and I've made the point before uh, in a couple of different lives that there was this in the um, search warrant there's like this boilerplate text. And I know that it's boilerplate text because I have a hair that I'm trying to get. Oh. Um, I know it's boilerplate text because I kept seeing it with different search warrants. But the search warrants referenced the fact that someone who had been interviewed by law enforcement on December 5th had knowledge that the kids had been killed. Um, and so the only ones who I have found who have been, who were interviewed on December 5th at this point were Ian and his ex-wife, Natalie Pulaski. Now the, this had also said someone who was close to, I think it was like close to one of the players or, or something like that. I can, I can pull it up, but, um, but yeah, so I strongly suspect that he knew that the kids were dead. Um, and, um, yeah. So, you know, even for him to make that statement that he did on Dateline about how this is like basically much ado about nothing, it, that it was, um, just a lot of hype. Yeah. Was, um, was pretty stunning. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Um, yeah. Trying to find it now. Yeah, I, I do have the screenshot that confirms that he and Natalie spoke to law enforcement on December 5th. Um, and... Let's see. Um, yeah, I'll share that. It's somewhere in here. I'll just share my screen. Okay. Um, See. Oh yeah, this is the date is right here, December fifth. So these are notes from their interview, um, and I believe that this was yeah, this was with Rexburg police, and then uh, Ian went back the next day and was interviewed by Rexburg police and the FBI, someone from the FBI, Ricky uh, something, forget his name. Brandon sent me an email that 
uh, was drafted by Natalie Pulaski, who expressed fear for herself and her children. Natalie was the recent ex-wife to Ian, and they had children in common. Natalie tracked down Brandon after she discovered Ian married Brandon's ex-wife, Melanie, on 11.30. After they married, M Melanie told Ian about her sp spiritual visions, redaction, redaction. Ian shared this information with Natalie, and they became concerned for their welfare. Now, keep in mind, this was one week before Alex uh, died. So once Alex died, Ian was out. He was like, oh, peace out. Like, I'm not in danger. My ex-wife isn't in danger. My kids aren't in danger. I'm no longer cooperating. Uh, and yeah, you can read this more <clears throat> at will. But they were interviewed on 12.5. And I, I know that, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what, yeah, I know that there was, um, uh, something about, um, yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's in it's in here somewhere, but I don't I don't know where it was. But anyway. But yes. Um so I think that he plays an interesting role as a secondary uh, character. <clears throat> okay, DC Babos asked, does anyone else think that Lori had something on him I'm sure this person is referring to Alex for him to literally kill people, including his own niece and nephew, like something bad when they were growing up. I wonder, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting was that when Colby was interviewed, he said that Alex started hanging around again in 2018. I, I don't think, I don't, think it said when in 2018. Um, but I did think it was interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I found it. <clears throat> All right. Share my screen again. I, I could just read them, but I just like the transparency of working with the screenshot. Colby indicated that he never really had a relationship with Alex. He described Alex as being a bum. Alex would tell him about his relationship with women and he thought he was nasty. Colby added that Alex started to come around more and became super close with Lori around 2018. When asked to describe the relationship between Lori and Alex, Colby started by talking about his knowledge his knowledge of Alex going after Joe Ryan. He knew that Alex was protective of Lori. Colby felt that Alex and Lori got close really fast. Oh yeah, this he did say January. That, that um, Colby felt that Alex and Lori got close really fast after January of 2018. Colby stated he knew Alex and Charles were, were cool with each other and that Charles had a lot of praise for Alex. So keep in mind, Joe died in March, mid to late March, and was found on April 3rd, 2018. So it looks to me like Alex just, you know, he was like the black sheep of the family. He was, um, according to Adam, he frequently went down to South America 
um, for he was involved in like the sex tourism. There, there have been allegations about that. Uh, and um, yeah, so, you know, he, he was the black sheep of the family. He had um, been uh, excommunicated from the church. And there are also allegations that when Barry Cox turned over his home to Alex, this was uh, right before he was arrested. Um, uh, this uh, had to do with his ongoing battle with the IRS, and he actually wrote a book about it. And it's actually, I think it's still on Amazon. But uh, yeah, so, and there are allegations. Um, this was in one of the documents that I have that isn't, uh, it's, it hasn't been circulated publicly, um, but it, it, it also stated, now keep in mind, this was someone's note who was involved in the investigations um, dating back to 2007. But in this document, it also, um, the, someone who had been interviewed said that Alex had like pulled all of this money out of the, um, the value of the home and spent it on hookers and, um, you know, riotous living, we'll just say. So I'm sure Barry also wasn't very happy about that. And this is also kind of a minor point, but it's just something that, you know, it might be nothing. Um, or it could be something, but I thought it was interesting that when Alex wrote the card to his friend, I think her name was Mary Elizabeth, he referred to his mom as Janice because he, no, it might have just been because, you know, because he was referring to her like to a friend. Um, but most people would still say, hey, can you ask my mom for, for something? But he referred to her as, as Janice. And um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, and then also I thought it was interesting that when Lori told Alex that she had identified the last of the, the dark spirits, she played this guessing game with him and, and told him to guess who it was. And, and, you know, again, this is an indicator of how slow Alex was. Like he, he started off with um, Brandon, but Brandon had already been, you know, identified as a dark spirit. So that wouldn't have been something new, but um, yeah. So, uh, but Alex guessed pops, meaning their dad. So I think that, you know, there, there, there was a, a lot of friction there and no one really, it doesn't seem like anyone really wanted to be associated too closely with Alex because, you know, like their um, connections to the church were very important to them. But it seems to me like Alex became valuable to Lori when Lori, I mean, this is conjecture, but I, I suspect that if Joe's death were investigated, they would find a money trail. And um, yeah, and I would be very curious if any of the $80,000 life insurance policy of which Lori uh, received 60,000, roughly, a little, little more than 60,000, if any of that went to Alex. So we'll, we'll never know, but according to, or we may never know, but according to Adam, only 2000 went to Tylee. Uh, Katie asked, did they ever determine Stacy Co Stacy Cox Cope's cause of death in 1998? Was Alex ever investigated since he was the only one at home with Stacy when he died? The rest of the family was in Hawaii. To my knowledge, her death was never investigated. It was, I, I think, I, I think it's actually 
in the, I haven't read all of those FOIA docs, but I, I think it, it is documented that um, it was an insulin overdose. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it was ruled suicide or accidental death. I don't know. Trying to remember to drink more. Oh, great, Mama Bear. <laughs> the heart made her uh, comment. Jump out. Yeah, um, oh, we have Mama Bear and Mochi Bear. Uh, back to back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, it said last year it was leaked that Lori has been diagnosed with uh, uh, schizophrenia. Uh, yeah, I don't know how reliable that source is, um, but I think it was schizoaffective disorder. But yeah, I, we don't we don't know. Okay, uh, Shane Murphy. Oh, hey, Shane uh, asked: Has Melanie's um, biological father, Stacy's ex, weighed in on this at all? That story alone is stranger than fiction. Any insight? Yes, he has. He was interviewed. His name is Steve Cope. He was interviewed by, I think, uh, Gilbert Police. And he talked about uh, evidence that he saw, without using the word radicalized, he talked about uh kind of evidence that he had seen throughout 2019 that um, Melanie was being radicalized. So um, he, one thing that's interesting, and I mentioned this in the live about Melanie Pulaski, then Boudreau, but when she told Brandon, that she wanted a divorce. This came out in the, the FOIA docs. And I thought that this was interesting. They were on vacation, like M Melanie, Brandon, and their kids were all on vacation and they were staying with Steve and his wife. So, you know, so Steve and his family lives in Utah, I believe. And Melanie and Brandon were in the Phoenix area in Gilbert. And so, so then, you know, so I don't know how often they got to see each other or, you know, like Steve got to be with his grandkids and stuff, but they go on this vacation. They're at Steve's house. And that is when Melanie drops the bomb on Brandon that she wanted a divorce. And we know that because Steve told investigators that, uh, I think Brandon called him from downstairs. So it kind of sounds like Steve has uh, a basement and they were um, uh, maybe in, in the basement, but they called him down and, and, and like involved him in this discussion. And so, so yeah, Melanie shared with him that, you know, um, that she wanted a divorce because, you know, Brandon was gay and there were pictures of him dancing with another guy and Brandon saying, well, hold up. It was a work event. We, we, you know, a bunch of us were dancing and she was also convinced that he was doing drugs and, you know, all kinds of stuff. So, Steve was there for that. I'm sure this was a bummer of a vacation because this would have overshadowed the rest of their time together. But anyway, so, um, yeah, so he, he talked mostly, he was mostly interviewed about, uh, Melanie. And so he, you know, I appreciated that 
he was really he he came across as very balanced in the interview. Um, I might have some of it uh, immediately accessible, but yeah, he he just he came across as um, yeah just just balanced, and um, he also said that in, in this interview, oops. Um, that Alex had spent 17,000, this I'll, I'll just read because it's short. Stephen briefly spoke about Alex Cox. Stephen stated that Alex would do anything for Lori and was her protector. Stephen had information that Alex got a girl pregnant when he was 19 years old. Stephen believed it happened back east somewhere. Alex would not take any responsibility for the child and left the woman. Furthermore, Stephen stated that Alex had racked up $17,000 on Stacy's credit cards following her death. The fraud was never reported to belief. I mean, to police. Um, and, oh, and this was kind of sweet. He said, um, Stephen told me he will stand behind the truth and not so much whether his daughter is innocent or guilty, which was really refreshing in this case. He is aware his daughter could be in serious trouble. And if he finds out she is responsible for some of these incidents, he will support her. Even if she has to serve time, he will be there for her. Stephen, thank me for all that is being done to try to find, I'm sure that was, um, the kids. This concluded my conversation with Stephen. So, yeah. So yes, he he did weigh in, and um, and I appreciated that. You know, he said that he recognized Melanie could be in trouble, and he he would stand by her, but he wants to know the truth. Okay. Question last year, it, oh, whoop, no. Sometimes while I'm, when I switch away, the, the chat keeps on going. And so I end up reading the same things again. <laughs> Thank you, Shane. <laughs> uh, you couldn't stay away. <laughs> Thank you for the kind words. Uh, Shane asks, are you planning on reading Colby's book? Mm, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I really am a bit of a, a one trick pony. Like I, if it's not directly pertinent to this case, I tend to suffer from a deplorable lack of curiosity, but I'm also, um, in a data science program, I'm very behind on homework, um, and, you know, balancing other things as well. So, yeah. Uh, no, um, Linda Texas said Stacy didn't actually die at home. No, she, um, no, she, she was in some, some kind of hospital because there was a family member, a Cox family member. Um, and this is what I actually really love about doing the Q and A's, you know, like it's like playing a game of, of memory and we get to address, you know, more, more topics and you guys ask really good questions. Uh, but let me see if I can quickly find, there was, um, let me see here. Oh, yes. Uh, Steve also said, Steve Koch also said that the Cox family stayed in Hawaii when um, Stacy died. And this, this I'll actually share because I think this might be the other thing I was looking for, but we'll see. Okay. In 1995, Stephen divorced Stacy and obtained full custody of Melanie. Stephen described it as one year later, 
there are quite a few typos in here. Stephen described it as one year later. However, Stacy passed away in 1998. Okay. Stephen stated he was notified that Stacy went into, and that's redacted. He learned that the rest of the family, and I think that was the medical center she was in. Um, he learned that the rest of the family was in Hawaii on vacation and Alex was home in Austin, Texas with his sister, Stacy. Stacy was taken to a hospital and was later transferred to a hospice facility. He responded with, with Melanie. So he responded. Okay. He responded with Melanie so she could say goodbye to her mother. Stephen was told by Alex he could not go in the room, but Melanie could. So typical Alex, <clears throat> excuse me. He told Alex his daughter was not going into the room without him. Good for you, Steve. Uh, Stephen was eventually allowed to go into the room and Melanie tucked a handwritten note in Stacy's hand. That was the last time they saw Stacy. Stephen noted that Janice Cox, ah, uh, yeah, this is, this is the reference. Stephen noted that Janice Cox's brother, Jason Connor, was at the hospice at that time. I think he was actually sick. But Stephen said Jason was frustrated because Stacy's family was not leaving Hawaii to take care of Stacy's arrangement. Jason told Stephen their response was, we're trying. It was Stephen's belief that the Cox family never came back for Stacy's death. Stephen told me the coroner believes Stacy's death was caused by, and that's redacted. Stephen told me that was not true as Stacy was a redacted. He believed these two things damaged her. And I actually, at one point, unredacted this. Um, hmm. And I remember heart and liver were close and I don't remember what, which one it was. I, I think it was heart, but I'll double check that. It should be noted that this investigator has been able to find documents such as police reports or coroner report related to Stacy's death. So. Oh, uh, Jake, when I talk about the media blitzkrieg, I'm just saying, like, I don't think they hired anyone. Um, although it does seem like someone put out this marching order, like, and sent the women out to like, okay, well, and well, not just women, also Colby, uh, to, you know, kind of go to bat for, uh, Lori, and I suspected at the time they were concerned that, um, that Lori was being underrepresented, but they weren't interested in paying for her, uh, legal bill. So, but I don't think that they hired a reputation management firm or anything like that. And if they did, they should get their money back. Mm. And yeah, I doubt they do because any reputation management firm would say, here's what you do. You don't say anything. And you certainly don't say that, you know, this many months later that you don't, you, you believe that the kids are fine. Oh yeah. Jenny, great point. Uh, she said, I, I like how Summer alluded that she knew a hitman. Yes. Yeah, so she has this boy toy. Um, what's his name? Edgar. And uh, he looks like a boy scout. Yeah. You know, he looks like he just recently went through puberty, but she stated, let me see if I can find that really quickly, because this was absolutely bizarre. And I talked about this in another live. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, so let me share my screen here. Okay, 
So I, I talked about in another live how essentially Lori set Summer up and she took the bait. I mean, Lori is not an intelligent person by any means, um, but she was, uh, she was, I don't know, more cunning than Summer was certainly in this exchange. So let me see where this was. Um, Okay. In both Lori's accounts, I'm assuming is here. I'm just going to start reading. She had regular, regular communication with her sister, Summer, who was listed in her phone as some. The number linked to Summer was redacted. Summer also shared Lori's religious beliefs. Oh, and I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit because I know a lot of people are on mobile devices. Okay. On October 7th at 1.04 in the afternoon, Summer sent Lori a message asking if she already knew about the Tesla incident. Lori responded you know, a couple hours later, <clears throat> indicating that she did not know. Summer asked if she could call, if she should call or text. Now, at this point, Lori had become much more tech savvy and she was telling people to call her. Like she wanted less and less put in text, especially after Charles found, you know, so much communication between her and Chad. Well, not so much. He did find quite a bit, um, but pretty damning communication. So <clears throat> that was when she bought, it was right after that, she and Chad both had alternative uh, cell phones. I believe they were both iPhones. And she was much more insistent that, um, that people text her. And that's actually noted by uh, law enforcement in the FOIA docs. So, um, uh, okay. Oh, and here, this is this is one of the places where I said Summer also shared Lori's religious beliefs. So that's also notable uh, because that re-emerged in the affidavit of probable cause uh, that came out of um, Chandler. Okay, uh, so Summer sent Lori a message. Lori responded. Oh, Summer asked if she should call or text Lori um, asked Summer to text her. The following is the text string as it appears. Summer, an incident that supposedly happened to Brandon sounds highly suspicious. Lori, Brandon's Tesla or the Tesla company? So Lori's playing dumb. Obviously, this was five days after Brandon was shot at. Obviously, Lori knew. Um, and Summer said, Brandon's, he claims someone shot at him and shot the window to his Tesla a few days ago. Police are looking at it. Okay. Um, and then Lori said, maybe it was Edgar. Where is he? And Summer, when you see these multiple question marks, there are, um, there are, usually emojis, but when they pulled all of these um, text messages into their system, uh, all of the emojis were just like overwritten with question marks. Um, but she said, I doubt it was him. And there is a picture of Summer with Edgar. I'll have to see if, if I have it, but she published it publicly. And this was fairly recent. But she said, I doubt it was him. He wouldn't miss or leave witnesses. He usually makes things look like natural causes, but IDK where he is or what he, he is doing. And then uh, Summer texted again. He has a message to me on his Smule page, but I haven't responded. And I had a whole live about Smule it, um, and how these different um, uh Family members were using Smule. It's um, in the live about Alex's like real motive for murder, something to that effect. Uh, Summer then forwarded Lori an image of an unknown subject on music recording app 
Smule with the username of XZZYZX. So apparently that was Edgar's username because he's just so sneaky. It is suspected that this was Edgar. Searching Smule through Lori's iCloud account, I discovered that she was using this app to send songs or communicate with Chad Daybell as well. This was evident in the links they would send to each other. Oh, someone should try to find if Chad Dayball's account is still on Smule. I'm really surprised that Alex and Lori's still were. Um, uh, Tylee also had a Smule account. Um, we, uh, some of her songs were, were set to public uh, and she had a beautiful voice, but um, yeah. So that's the, that's the story with Edgar. Um, let me see if I can, if I have the, the picture of them readily available. Um, I might. So I, I don't know if uh, Summer has given up on her temple recommend or she's passing him off as um, just a friend. Oh, here it is. I found it. There we go. That's Edgar, the toddler. Real tough guy. So do I believe that Edgar is actually a hitman? No. Um, you know, I think that Summer was just trying to talk big and tough like Lori. Mm. And, you know, neither of them thought that these exchanges would one day become public record. Not touching questions about people monetizing the, or making money off the case. Um, Yeah, nurse, nurse Han, Han, uh, asks, I've heard schizoaffective disorder may be Lori's diagnosis. Yes, that's what a certain YouTuber um, released. Did you see any signs in your dealing with her? So, possibly, but... Mm, for the most part, no. So the, the reason I say possibly is that, you know, and I don't know where like her religious beliefs ended and, um, and the really bizarre beliefs picked up. I, I do remember her telling me, uh, I guess it was like, I don't know, something about the pre-mortal something or other like that, um, that I had, uh, like somehow like met with God and the angels and Jesus before I was born. And I agreed to everything that was going to happen to me. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this is I, I don't remember if this is actually, um, L, you know, within the LDS uh, corpus of beliefs, but for me, that was, you know, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it was very strange and it was at minimum a little tone deaf because uh, she knew some of my story, mostly from Joe. Um, so, and, and then, you know, beyond that, like there, yeah, it's, it's not like I'm hedging. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to walk that line of like, I mean, for the most part, most of the bizarre behavior I saw from Lori 
was more tethered to her having no internal editor. And I've talked about that a number of times. And so I found that she was very obsessive. Like when we were on that 2007 vacation, she was obsessed with Joe. She wanted to talk about Joe. She wanted to talk about how abusive he was and, you know, all, all of that. And, um, and I don't remember her ever using the word evil, but so I, I don't know. I, I, but like, then, you know, I've, I've alluded to this a few times, like, you know, there, there was something that she had shared about like something her, her family did. It wasn't like, illegal or anything like that, but it was bizarre. And it was bizarre that she would tell me like she didn't have an internal editor that let her know, like, this is not something that you should ever tell another person outside your family who apparently was copacetic with this very bizarre activity. But, um, so yeah, so I, you know, again, I have no training, but I, I tend to believe that Lori is more evil than schizophrenic. And I've talked about this before, so I won't go too much into it, but my biological mother was schizophrenic. So I don't know the difference between schizo schizophrenic and schizoaffective disorder. I'm sure there's, there's some line between them, but, you know, as I've mentioned before, my mother couldn't turn it on and turn it off at, at will. Like, she, and she couldn't blend. She couldn't blend in any environment. Like she was the, the, you know, um, yeah, I don't, yeah, <clears throat> but so, you know, and I just don't see that with Lori. So, you know, is there, is there some kind of mental disorder? Possibly. Um, but I also think that, you know, some of her frenetic behavior patterns and strange beliefs, like thinking that her, you know, her, her dead attorney, was visiting her at night. I suspect that one of the things I've talked about before with Lori is that when she gets away with something, she can't help herself. She likes to talk about it. She is very much like a serial killer in that regard. Like I've seen enough true crime shows where, you know, someone will commit a murder and they'll find ways to talk about the murder but in a way that's socially acceptable and the person hearing it doesn't, doesn't know that they're talking about the murder, but they, they get off on talking about it. And I think that's exactly what Lori did in sharing her testimony on October, I think it was like October 19th, 2018, something like that. That was the testimony she shared in Melanie Gibbs' home where she went into you know, a lot of detail about Joe and wanting to murder him and you know, basically giving a bishop an ultimatum, either you give me a te temple recommend or I'm going to commit murder. I think all of this, like, I think at that point she had grown confident that no one was coming after her. Like right after Joe was found, I, I've mentioned this before, I think it's interesting that she took off for Hawaii, which is a solid, you know, um, behavioral pattern for her. Uh, and so I think that that, you know, indicates more guilt. Like she didn't know if someone was going to come after her and try to question her. And then she made her way back because no one was going after her. And, and again and again, like she would take off and no one was coming after her. <clears throat> and then she would just kind of make her way back. But, um, yeah. So I think with, with Lori, I think, he, even in talking about her 
uh, att attorney who had passed, who was visiting her, I think Lori used, a, now we don't know if she legitimately you know, w was having these hallucina hallucinations, but I think, I do wonder if some of it was Lori's way of adding undue weight to her righteousness, to her stake, you know, for her claim for whatever it is that she wants. Like at that point, she wanted full custody of Tylee. So it was like, you know, her dead attorney came to her and it all worked to together to like, it was like these, these claims, like she's seen Jesus. She's talked to Jesus. She saw this attorney who passed. She talked to him. She believed that Tylee was a reincarnation of Stacy. So everything had to have this like undue weight. And I shared this really early on in the case, but I haven't shared it in a while. But I thought it was interesting that when Lori told me the story about going on, um, oh, what was the game show that she went on? Uh, yeah, it'll come to me. Um, and I don't want to scroll down, but anyway, she went on a game show. I'm, I'm blanking on which one it was, but when she told me the, the story, um, and I believe that this was when I visited her and Joe either on that vacation with my kids or when I, I first met them, I think it was the vacation with my kids, but I'm not exactly sure. It, it could have been the 2007 vacation. But I think Joe was there because um, when she told me that, that story, she had um, posited it as the Lord told her that she was going to go on, oh, it's the Wheel of Fortune. The Lord told her she was going to go on the Wheel of Fortune and she was uh, going to win. And she told me that she told Joe this and that he rolled his eyes. And I seem to think that Joe was actually standing there, but I'm a little fuzzy on that anyway. But so then she, you know, went on Wheel of Fortune and won, uh, you know, a, a fair amount of money. And, um, but, you know, so like I would see that as, you know, she probably found out that you could audition for the Wheel of Fortune. And, you know, she was very beautiful. She was very gregarious. She had, you know, a very magnetic personality for that kind of show, you know, like your kind of classic, you know, cheerleader appearance. And I think she just went for it and, you know, was able to do fairly well. But in her telling of it, it wasn't that just that she came up with this idea and it worked out. It was God told her. So I think it, it was, it's kind of more, it, it, from my opinion, it seems to be more that kind of thing. Like she just wants to add additional weight. And I think she just sees herself as God's most special snowflake. And that seems to be a pretty, um, you know, a scarlet thread throughout all of these different stories. And, and, and then, you know, at times that shows up as the femme fatale, like she is being righteously persecuted. And of course it's because of her incredible calling. So I think when she, you know, had this confluence with Chad Daybell, it was, you know, um, yeah, I, I think it was just the perfect storm of, uh, you know, all of their weird beliefs. Uh, Katie asked, other than Adam and Nicole Cox, did any other um, members of the Cox family speak with law enforcement when JJ and Tylee went missing? From the information that we have at this time, and again, we don't have FOIA docs from Idaho, uh, Adam 
and Nicole didn't say anything when they didn't come forward when the kids went missing. Um, so we, they don't pop up except in July and August or yeah, the first time N Nicole reached out to Detective Moffitt, I think it was like August 8th, 2019. And, and then Detective Moffitt called Adam the next day. Uh, August 9th. Then <clears throat> Nicole had interactions with Kay, um, but there's no record of them reaching out to law enforcement again. So, um, you know, who knows, it might come out in, in the trials from Idaho, but, um, uh, but yeah, there's there's also no record, uh, f you know, from the Arizona documents of mm, trying to remember of any of the family members uh, coming forward after. I mean, you know, like it's there. There's a big question mark when the family knew the the kids were missing, and I, I've covered this in a couple of lives, but. Um, we know from two different references from Kay that, oh, Kay and, I'm sorry, Kay and Jess, um, who was, Jess was uh, Brandon's business associate or partner's wife. And she was interviewed by Lauren um, from Hidden True Crime. And she had said that they all knew the kids were missing in October. I think there's some revisionist history going on there because no one was looking for Tylee. So they were, they were like kind of this cabal researching. Cabal might not be the right word. That's definitely not the right word. They were kind of a, a cadre of um, interested parties who were doing their own research, trying to find where Lori lived and, um, and, you know, track down JJ. Uh, and we also know from, from Kay, uh, from their first press conference, that they knew that the, the kids were missing in October. We don't know when in October. So, um, yeah, but other than, other than that, we don't have, that I can think of, we don't have any records of, like, family members, at least reaching out to uh, law enforcement in Arizona. And there were different like friends who reached out. Like there was a, a friend of Melanie Boudreaux, Ben Boudreaux, <clears throat> and, and the rest of them were like tracked down by law enforcement, um, like the whole like Hawaii contingency and uh, April Raymond and, you know, um, all of, all of those people. So, yeah. Um, could conspiracy to commit murder charges be brought against these two freaks re regarding so-called zombies as a hit list? Well, we know that conspiracy the, the charge against Lori is conspiracy to commit murder with Charles. Um, and they are both charged with one of their charges is conspiracy to commit murder um, from coming out of Idaho. They chose the, uh, um, the prosecutor from Maricopa County decided not to move forward with charges against Chad in the conspiracy to um, murder Charles. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Who is Audrey and how does she fit into Lori and Chad's minions? <laughs> Audrey is a very interesting character. She... <clears throat> has largely stayed under the radar. It was really in the last two um, FOIA document dumps that she kind of made it onto the radar more. So here are a few 
talking points around Audrey. There was an Audrey that was listed in Chad's trust ratings um, who was awarded a perfect trust score of 100 out of 100, along with Raphael. And um, there, there are indicators that Raphael is Chad. So I don't know why he would be listed on that list. So that's, um, but um, I, th I think one of Chad's burner phones may have been called Raphael. I have to look into that. So, um, and Audrey was given a perfect 100 um, trust score, which even beat out Melanie Gibb and um, Zulema. Uh, another fun fact about Audrey is that she was the one who most likely Lori and Melanie um, then Boudreaux stayed with when um, when Tammy was originally allegedly supposed to be murdered by Alex Cox. They went to uh, Missouri. Um, now we know from the FOIA docs, Lori went, I've shared before that a confidential source had told me back in uh, 2020 and that Melanie was also on that trip to Missouri. So <clears throat> uh, originally Audrey had said, uh, according to these um, text exchanges, that um, Audrey had said they could stay with her. And Lori said, no, we'll get a hotel and you can stay with us. And Lori references Audrey showing them the sites around, this was Independence, Missouri. And there's a whole storyline around why Lori was supposed to go to Independence. And so like the 144,000 wouldn't be gathered until she, she had to go to independent. I think it was independence, Missouri. Um, and <clears throat> I don't know, it was like some kind of sacrifice and then she would be ready to lead the 144,000. So, so Audrey was involved with that. Audrey has a certification in herbology. So that could potentially be very interesting. Um, especially now I'm not alleging that she was involved in poisonings or anything like that, but I just think it's interesting that she has this background in herbology. And I said this in another live, I think the hundred trust rating is significant because if this is the same Audrey uh, I think to get a, a, a hundred percent trust rating, I strongly suspect that she had um, incriminated herself in some way. I suspect, now this is conjecture, but I suspect the only way that someone would get like a well, 100%, like you are completely confident that this person will never turn on you is if they have something against her. So, um, now, I mean, we may not find out until the trials and we may not find out at all, but I do think that that, if this is the same, Audrey, I, I do think that it is very significant. Um, and, uh, there were, um, another detail with Audrey was that when law enforcement reached out to her, she was completely loyal to Lori and Chad. She wouldn't disclose where they were in Hawaii and she wouldn't pass on, I think, uh, Lori's contact info. I think they had asked for that. Um, another detail about her was that Lori texted Audrey from the Walgreens the day Charles was shot. So we know, and I forgot to mention that or point this out in the one screenshot, but, uh, I did think it was interesting that Lori went into the Walgreens alone. So I suspect that 
Tylee and JJ were left in the car and they were most likely eating breakfast. So Lori went into the Walgreens alone. And now uh, keep in mind, Charles had just been shot, like shot and murdered. Uh, and, you know, they, but he wasn't, she, he wasn't dead yet. She, I don't think at this point she had gotten the text from Alex. Or I think she got one call from Alex when she was at Burger King, if memory serves me. You can go back to, like I did a whole live on retracing Lori's steps the day Charles was shot. But I think she received a call from Alex while she was at the Burger King. And then she received another call. It might have actually been before the Walgreens. But anyway, but she was in the Walgreens and texted Audrey. And um, so they. it was uh, stated in the FOIA doc that they didn't know the content of the text, but they could see that it had been sent. <clears throat> um, and um, she... Was I remember someone? I think this was on Reddit, maybe. Um, but someone had said she was like at that time, um, Facebook friends with Melanie Gibb and Jason Mao, um, and was an in home caregiver. Um, so that that goes back to early, I think, pretty early 2020. And what else do we know about her? Um, oh, yes. Uh, Lori also texted Audrey when she was in Hawaii. Um, so the text message was deleted, um, but it said deleted message to unknown recipient. And um, Lori had said, not sure how long we will be here until our work is done. And that was on October 18th. So this was the day before um, Tammy died. And then um, it said, looking at Lori Bellow's phone records, this text would have been between Lori and Audrey. So... Yeah, I think those are the main, I feel like I might be missing something. Um, but yeah, I think those are the, the, the main talking points around Audrey. Um, yeah. And, and then just that, that whole thing of like, she had a really weird reason for not giving police, uh, Lori's contact info, Lori and Chad's contact info. Okay, I'll take a couple more questions, um, <laughs> Diana. Yeah, my hair has gotten long. I mean, especially from the beginning of this case, but thank you for the kind words. Yeah, my, um, <laughs> I, I, I had wanted a pixie so badly and I got it and hated it. And so then I started growing my hair out and it was in, and I went to a stylist and I, I gave her a picture. She gave me an undercut. So it really set me back. So it was growing out so weird, but I was like, okay, I'm just going to go into hiding and, you know, um, and yeah, and just like let it get to a point where I could get it cut. And then this case broke. So, um, yeah, in my, in my first interview, I had like Mrs. Brady hair. It was awful. Okay. Um, uh, Sarah asked, what does a temple recommend? I, I'm not LDS, but it's essentially, if I understand it, and I'm not the best person to ask, but, um, but it basically is almost like a certification of sorts that you are walking the walk. Um, you are interviewed and, um, and, uh, I, I don't know how in depth they look into a person's life. I know that there have been mentions, um, from Zulema about like, she was trying to get her temple recommend restored and, 
Um, she was concerned about one of her previous marriages and she was like withdrawing a temple recommend request from one, um, I, I don't, a ward, I think, uh, and was going to try for another. So, uh, I'm sure there are questions around like if, if you're divorced and, um, but, uh, you know, a, a divorce doesn't, uh, disqualify someone, but I guess there are like, you know, um, questions around that if, if you were divorced. And so, and I believe that temple rec recommends are good for two years. So again, not the best source. And a lot of this peripheral information, I don't always retain because, I am a bit of a rain man with like, you know, sometimes even like basic details, like Janice Summers, um, she'll, she'll mention something to me and she'll be like, yeah, I told you that. And I'm like, I have no memory whatsoever, but then, you know, like I'll be talking about the case and I'll remember like a specific date that something happened and like really weird details. But so, um, yeah, so, um, okay. I'll, I'll answer two more questions. Uh, Shane asked, is Summer still married? I I'm assuming so. I haven't heard that she is divorced. Um, so yeah, the, the sharing the, the, the picture with Ed Edgar was, it was a weird flex, but you know, who, who knows? Um, okay. Um, Oh, uh, Kay asks, where is that list of people in the group with extreme beliefs? There was a list in the affidavit of um, probable cause, and I shared that. I actually read it in my last live. Let me see if I can also uh, find it in one of the FOIA docs. Uh, I'll just search for beliefs. Let me see. Hmm. Um. I'll just, I remember that it was like all of the typical players. Um, let me see. Yeah. I think it was mostly the the people in this group. Um, I'll just search one other place. But, um, Yeah. Um, I'll search one more thing and then ah, found it. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll share my screen. Okay. 
Using these interviews and the data, data gathered from the above mentioned warrants, several others who shared Lori and Chad's belief system were identified. Those pertinent to the investigation were identified as Melanie Boudreau, Alex Cox, Zulema Pasenas, uh, Summer Shiflet, Lori Vallow, and Chad Daybell. All right. So that, that's who was actually listed. Okay. Um, all right. One more question. Uh, let's see. Oh, Laura Nelson asked, is there a, a copy of their final dark zombie list? Um, no, no, there's not. Um, if, if there is, it was redacted. Um, let me see if I can find find where Lori references, uh, like the last one. Okay. Ah, I said it was 20, it was 24. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I have, uh, I'll share my screen. Let me see if there's a better reference. Um, Okay, yeah, this is, all right, I'll use this. Because this goes into a little more detail. Okay, so, all right, they were talking about Alex picking up um, Charles' uh, truck from the airport. Hmm. Excuse me. Um, okay. On September 3rd at 10 in the morning, Alex sent Lori a text. At, oh, I'll zoom in. Okay. On September 3rd at 10 o'clock, Alex sent Lori a text asking what she was doing. Excuse me. having a coughing fit here. Lori responded, working on Z's. Z's um, most likely referred to zombies. What did you decide on username and password? Alex would tell Lori that he was proud of her and state, no more Z's. Lori replied, <laughs> anyway, um, we are trying to get to the bottom of what we need to do to eliminate them completely. And I actually never really caught that, that Alex had said, like, if the Z stands for zombies, and I'm sure it does, uh, this was just days before Tylee was murdered and just a few weeks before JJ was murdered. But it was right after they had moved to Idaho. So, um, yeah, that's... That's interesting. I'm going to have to chew on that one. Okay. <clears throat> we are trying to get to the bottom of what we need to do to eliminate them completely. So obviously she's talking about zombies. I'm sure you will be told also heart emoji. So yeah, so she's, she's in full manipulation mode. And Alex then stated, I am going to get lunch and probably go to the range to sight in my rifles. The following text string was then noted. So it's like she starts talking about zombies. There are more zombies. And he's like, okay, I'm going to go get lunch and then go to the range, which is bizarre. But um, Lori said, bad news on our brother, Alex. What's that? Lori, Z. Alex, 
Really? When was that? <clears throat> Lori, as of early January. So she's saying Adam turned into uh, a zombie in early January. <clears throat> that explains his interest in Charles. Ned recruited, uh, Alex said that. Lori, Ned recruited him shortly after. This is why. Lori, he's part of the 24. So there were 24 significant zombies. Alex, that made sense. Wow. Lori, more sad news. Guess who is the final Z of the 24? Alex, Pops or Brandon? Um, uh, oh, and then Alex guessed Adam. And Lori said, nope. Think of Judas, who loved me completely and then turned against me. Well, I filled in that redaction. So all the normal caveats apply. <clears throat> um, but obviously, she's also, well, never mind. She already said our brother. So again, you can see how slow Alex is. Not that I'm actually being very quick here tonight. But um, that, you know, she already identified Adam as a zombie. And then he guessed Adam as the final one, you know, but anyway, nope. Think of Judas who loved me completely, then turned against me. And Alex, tell me, so he's done with the guessing games. He sucks at them. Lori, yes, our sweet. And <clears throat> Zach fits in that. He is in paradise. So this is, again, confirmation that when someone turns into a zombie, there is no pulling them back from the edge. And I keep drilling that point home because these women who say, oh, no, we weren't praying, you know, for people to die. No, we were we were doing the biblical thing and we were trying to, you know, convince uh, as Melanie Gibb, I believe, said, we were trying to convince the evil spirits to leave them. No. Someone uh, assigned the label of zombie. They became a zombie because they died. Their spirit left. They either went on to another probation. In this case, uh, Zach was, in, if if this was Zach, um, <clears throat> he was in paradise um, the real Zach, and then you're overtaken by a zombie. And this is how they, you know, justify what they do. It finally makes sense. Alex, when did that happen? Lori, about the time he turned, makes sense. He being dedicated to Brandon and Ned. Ned, of course, uh, referring to Charles. Alex, so February, and I, I made this point before that I think that the fact that they, you know, Lori confirmed, yep, February, it looks like when there was that like kind of explosion that happened on January 30th and 31st, it looks like Zach was more siding with Lori. And I think that's why the Charles made that reference to, he hadn't received any, um, return messages or calls from Zach for, it was a, around a week <clears throat> because he said, he said one day uh, of the week, I think he's what, whatever day it was. And the, the officer asked, Oh, like yesterday. And he said, no, last, whatever it was, let's just say Wednesday. He was like, no, it's the last Wednesday. So I think it was like right around 10 days, something like that. So Zach had, you know, gone radio silent on, on Charles. And Charles was trying to get a hold of him to have him let him in the house because he was locked out because someone took his truck, which is where his keys were. But anyway, so then it looks like in Feb at some point in February, Zach realigned and was uh, pro Brandon and Charles. And that may have happened when he moved out or shortly after he moved out of Charles and Lori's and moved in with Brandon and Melanie. So, um, so I think that this is, you know, potentially more confirmation that she is talking about Zach and he, he, 
he is a really sweet guy. Like I, I knew him when he was a little boy and then he was at the house when I visited in 2018 and he was very close to, at that time to both, um, Lori and to Colby. So anyway, it, it does it, every indication seems like she's talking about Zach. Okay. Alex, how did Zach die or was he forced out? Lori, it's crazy, I know, but it's sad and true. Now we know all 24. So she doesn't want to go into, you know, details. She just says forced out, I think. And then she goes on with his anxiety. He wasn't strong enough to fight back. Alex, mm. Lori, JJ is stronger, fights them off every day. Lori, Zach was a 3L. JJ is a, oh yeah, this was JJ's rating, 4.3L uh, for light. Alex, that's when he yells no. Um, uh, so I think Alex is referring to JJ. And Lori said, yep. Alex, are you going, are you going to tell Shish about Adam or Zach? And Shish is most likely um, Summer, and Summer's name did fit in here. But Lori said no, two exclamation marks. Lori, Summer's trust level is too low. Alex, okay. Oh, I saw one of my mods. Um, okay, when, uh, yeah, I just see it. I'm muted. All right. Um, did you, dang it. Uh, did you hear any of what I read about the, the last of the zombies? I'm, I'm watching the comments now. Can someone answer if, okay, after my share, a screen share, I stopped. Okay, great, good. Then, um, yeah, I was just looking to see if I could find the the light and dark um, list. I know I, I linked to it in my, um, I know I, ah, okay, I found it. Okay, I this will be the last thing that I'll share. And um, yeah, and then we'll, we'll be done for the evening, but we'll pick it back up uh, in a couple of weeks. Just one second. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so um, oh no, this, this wasn't, 
wait, there, there was another one. Okay. I, I think I had it. Yeah. I had it pulled up. Here we go. Okay. So, um, let me make sure. Yes. Okay. So Barry Cox had a light rating, Janice light rating, Stacy light rating. She graduated to a 4.1 L Alex Cox, uh, light, but not that light, especially for being the family hitman. Mm. Allegedly, <clears throat> Adam had a light rating, a, a pretty high light rating uh, on par with Barry and Janice. This document was, uh, we don't, we don't know when it was actually emailed. I don't think, um, <clears throat> we know that Charles found it in March and forwarded it to Kay. And that part we, we do know. Um, but anyway, okay. So, um, it, oh, but yeah, yeah, no, we don't know. Okay. Um, Laura, that was the, the Cox child who died as an infant. She was rated a 3L, graduated to a 4.1L like Stacy. Lori, 4.3L. Summer, 3L. Mm. <laughs> Her husband is a 2L, but borderline 2D. Uh, so Chad had said, like, if you were in the, um, if you you were two and under, I think you could like switch sides. There was something most, uh, where does she talk about that? Twos and threes are fluid and can change sides during earth life. 4.1 and above have made covenants to their side. They rarely switch sides. So that would have included Tylee and Joe, According to Chad, they made covenants with the dark side and they rarely switch sides. However, there was one person who was L and became dark and that was JJ. So, um, okay. Uh, Lori's first husband, 2L, second husband, uh, William Lagoya to D, um, Colby three L Kelsey three D, uh, third husband, Joseph Ryan, 4.3 D is now sealed away. Daughter 4.1 D fourth husband, Charles Vallow. He was a three L. Um, but again, obviously he became, uh, dark first wife, uh, two First, first wife, 2D, Cole Vallow, 3D. Oh, I think he was referring to Charles' first wife. <clears throat> um, Cole Vallow, 3D, Zach Vallow, 3L, um, JJ, 4.2L, niece, Melanie, 3L, um, Brandon, 3D, and their four kids, both boys are 3L. Older girl is a 3L. He really liked the younger girl. She was a 4.1L. So, um, but also keep in mind that Melanie had said that with kids, they could be light and, and then become dark, like pretty much on a turn of a dime. And so, um, and she had, uh, had told, Ian, that two of her kids had become dark. So, and I talked in that live about, I, I mean, I, I think those kids really could have been in peril uh, because Melanie tried to pick her kids up from school early one day and Brandon had already taken them out of school and she and Lori, again, if my source is correct, uh, she and Lori left for Hawaii the next day. So I suspect that, um, that 
Melanie was going to take her kids with her. So thank you, Juliana. Very kind. Um, but okay, that concludes the live for tonight. So the, um, the moral here is if you want your question answer, I don't even know how many I didn't get to. Um, sometimes I'm really bombed when I read over the questions because I'll find a really, really good question. But tonight, these questions were all, all great. I knew that there was a risk in like going back and forth, but um, it worked out tonight. So, um, so it was, it was pretty smooth for all of the like switching back and forth and being able to kind of find things on the fly. So we will do this again. If you want your question answered, you can, I mean, as soon as I announce the, the live, like you can go in and you can um, drop your, your question, you know, so I usually announce the lives like the day before. Um, but <clears throat> anyway, so thank you for all of the great questions. Um, if I didn't answer your question, please come back in a couple weeks and, um, and drop your question again. So thank you again and have a great night.